Okay, good evening everyone and uh, very welcome to Meza Terra. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Sonia Galyan. Uh, Sonia is an assistant professor at the Department of English and Cultural Studies at Christ University. Her doctoral research has explored the role of children in films and the various themes they represent within the cinematic imagination of contemporary Indian cinema. And through this work, she contributes to the nascent academic discipline of children's films in India. She is the recipient of the Charles Wallace India Trust Research Fellowship in 2017 and the National Fellowship at the Indian Institute of Ad Advanced Studies at Shimla this year, where she would have been had it not been for COVID. Her main area of work is Indian cinema and children's film and media culture. And she's going to be talking to us of uh, Indian animation. So over to you. Sonia. Thank you. Thank you, Rashmi. I hope I'm audible. Just let me know if I am. Yeah, you're, you're audible. Yeah. OK. Thank you so much. Uh, I, first of all, I'd like to thank my own department for organizing this talk and also giving me the opportunity to give me a chance to talk about something that I've been trying to write for a while now and also just reflect on some of the ideas that have collated so far in my writing for this paper uh, as a book chapter. And uh, let me just give a little bit of a warning before I begin my talk that uh, it won't be super erudite and scholarly in terms of the deductions and conclusions I have to make. But uh, since the topic itself is about storytelling, I will also try and sort of narrate the story of this history of animation in the Indian context. So uh, I hope uh, I can do some justice to uh, the kind of work that has been going on in this field. and. Uh, I would place my arguments towards the end of the talk uh, where uh, I'll be also happy to take in some of the comments because this is a work in progress paper. Uh, so any kind of suggestions and ideas that this research can lead to would be very much appreciated. And also I would be more comfortable uh, because A, I don't have a very good internet and B, because I'll be more comfortable without the camera on. So I've, uh, Please excuse me if I switch off my camera and come towards the end on the camera again. I will begin my talk now. Uh, can I also have the PPT uh, to be presented now? So today I want to talk about the history of animation, particularly in the Indian context. And I want to look at how this history or this trajectory of Indian animation has sort of progressed to the contemporary times, uh, which is right now. Uh, but as anything else that we start to look at in terms of research, we always tend to go back from the beginning to the beginning. Next slide, please. So uh, I would also then look at uh, animation that has existed way before uh, the cinema itself that came into being. So cinematography will, as we know, is an earlier, earlier 20th century invention, but animation in the form of movement and in form of popular shows that were there for a public audience. And this idea of animation, which I will talk what it is exactly about, existed way before that. Shadow play and Magic Lantern have been part of uh, sort of performative theater and storytelling traditions all the way till from the 16th century itself. Uh, popular shows were organized where uh, uh, images were sort of projected on screen, sometimes cloth screen, sometimes just a stretched out material that was then put against a light or oil lamp or any kind of artificial light that was there available. And then the images were sort of moved uh, behind the curtain and the reflection of that was what was visible to the audience. Also, Magic Lantern is sort of considered to be the first film projector, which is uh, nothing but a wooden box where lenses, again, which are painted with glass slides, are sort of fitted inside, uh, inside the box and the zoom lens is placed outside of it. Uh, this is the image of that that you can see. Uh, and the light is then again projected from the other side. So once uh, the slides are sort of put in the box and sort of moved from one slide to the other, it gives the illusion of uh, movement. And animation is that. Animation from the word itself, from the original uh, origin itself, means 
to be embodied with life. It is a movement. It is an action. It is something where an inanimate object is sort of made to appear to move. And it has had a very long and an interesting kind of a history in what it is today as we see in the CGI technology format, as we uh, know about VFX and all the 3Ds and the 4Ds that we have. Uh, apart from this kind of tradition in magic uh, lanterns and shadow puppetry, which was both in Europe and America, India itself has also had a similar trajectory where oral storytelling uh, traditions, especially through performative arts, like uh, the dance of leather puppets, which is popularly known as Tolu Bumbata, and it has various versions of it, popularly uh, sort of uh, coming from states like Andhra Pradesh. Next slide, please. Uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, which was basically uh, where very, very large, almost five feet tall puppets were sort of drawn uh, with multiple joints and they were colored from on both sides. And again, then a cloth, like a cotton cloth was sort of used as a projector screen behind which oil, lamp, uh, oil lamps or light was sort of projected and a narrator would then, the puppeteer would then also orally narrate these stories through the use of music and tell the stories and folk tales, uh, mostly from the mythologies of uh, Mahabharata and Ramayana. They were sort of dramatized. So it was both oral and also performative. So there was an audience and it was usually for a very uh, select audience for a small number of uh, you know, people that uh, sort of gathered in a village and then these uh, narratives sort of moved as well uh, from village to village narrating their stories. So this kind of tradition also existed very much. That's the image of shadow puppetry as it uh, would have existed earlier uh, uh, in, in, the India, in the Indian context. We still have this tradition uh, which is surviving and uh, parts of these communities are still performing. Something that I will talk about a little later in my talk and how it is surviving and what are the challenges it is facing. But this is something that existed from the beginning itself. And also, we also had our own versions of, uh, so to speak, uh, you know, a magic lantern, which came to be known as Shambharik Karolika, which is a Sanskrit word for magic lantern. And people from uh, the 19th century uh, onwards, especially pioneers like Madan Rao Chitale and his successor Madhav Patwarthan were sort of experimenting with these kind of magic lanterns. They sort of tried to treat the visual uh, with the dialogue, narrations, lyrics, and background music, and sort of, again, did small shows in the neighborhood, but then also slowly tried to make these kind of uh, episodic entertainment shows for even commercial purposes, entertaining the public and also, in that sense, getting some kind of a revenue and some kind of a, you know, financial kind of an in the, uh, uh, you know, activity and employment in that sense. Again, the tales told in this format itself were from the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, and mostly, uh, you know, the, the, the stories of Krishna's birth, his life, his childhood, the Swayamvar, and things like that. So that's an image of how the box uh, sort of looked like. And all this is before cinematography, all this is before the Lumineer brothers sort of really invented and we moved towards the 20th century, where the miracle of the century happened in that sense. Uh, the motion pictures came into being and the art of cinematography, the moving uh, sort of became the order of the day, the visual became the order of the day and it has had its own trajectory. And uh, uh, the six silent films that were uh, made by the Luminaire brothers were also then screened in uh, Bombay uh, at the Watson's Hotel in 1896. And since then, we all have been a generation and almost had a history of movies in, in our country as well. And from there, it kind of grows on. Uh, having said that, uh, again, since the cinema is now cinematography and cinema is in, uh, picture, uh, in, in picture and now we are in the 20th century, uh, sort of from there, the trajectory, how the West, uh, the how animation has sort of developed in the West, vis-a-vis what has uh, come to be in India, is kind of it kind of takes a uh, kind of a divergence from there. Till now, we kind of did have all these things simultaneously going, but then 
after the 20th century, like where animation in the West, and especially in Europe, France, Polish uh, uh, animators were one of the earliest ones. Uh, uh, Phantasmagory, which is uh, the first uh, cartoon animation, which is a hand-drawn animation that was made by Emily Cole, was considered the first animation of uh, one of its kind. And uh, American uh, animation also started simultaneously very early on. And uh, Phantasmagory was interesting because, again, they tried to use a lot of, uh, you know, a dark setting and music against a backdrop where they tried to create specters of light projecting in the form of ghosts. And again, this kind of animation had that purpose to sort of promote this rational spirit and sort of, you know, a very scientific way to say, or burst the myth of uh, there is nothing like the ghost and spirit that exists. And now we are the scientific, the modern world. And, you know, any kind of uh, superstition associated with the world of the spirits or anything of that kind was sort of then uh, sort of broken from there. But it was very interesting the way uh, Phantasmagora, which is what I'll talk about a little later, because it's also a philosophical concept. Uh, not just the film, and it has a something to uh, something intuitively aligned with how animation is also as an art form. Uh, moving again from uh, again from the Western uh, perspective, then the Disney came into the picture in the 1920s. There was Mickey Mouse, which became the first cartoon. The sound came into the picture, and Walt Disney sort of then made the you know, made animation of its own. And it was kind of considered since then, you know, as the golden period of animation. Snow White uh, and the Seven Dwarfs is, uh, can I have the next slide, please? Was kind of considered the next slide. I'll come back to this. Yeah, Snow White is kind of considered the first feature length animation film by Disney. And uh, since then, uh, it's all been history. Like there have been multiple uh, animation. It's a multi, uh, multi-dollar uh, industry. And since then, and, uh, Disney has sort of kind of been synonymous with how we understand or even talk of animation. That is also a point that I will come back to later. While in the Indian context, now coming back to that, uh, where cinema also started in India, and we have pioneers like Dada Saheb Falke and his contemporaries, who did also try to use stop motion animation. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, this this particular uh, thing that you can see with the matchbox here is actually the film that he made, which was the game of matchsticks, uh, which had a Marathi name. Uh, sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. It's Adanchi Moj. And it was also inspired by the works of Phantom, uh, Phantasmagory in 1908 by Emily Cole. And uh, this was one of the stop, uh, first stop motion animation that we can say made by the pioneer and the father of animation and that's uh, father of cinema in that sense in India. But again, as an industry or as a unit of its own or having uh, animation to be seen in its own right kind of didn't really take off from there. It kind of didn't have that kind of a trajectory where, you know, one invention leads to another and then sort of the industry grows, people start taking interest in it. So these are the kind of challenges that animation has faced, which is something I'll come back to uh, a little later in my talk. But in terms of trajectory, so we did have, so you can see Jambu Kaka in the 1940s, uh, which was sort of uh, one of the cartoon characters that was created. Then you have Rangin Chutkia in the 1950s. But as a, as a unit, as an established name of animation only started in the socialist India, which is the post-independent India, uh, primarily through the state. So in that sense, animation has been the child of the state. It was introduced by the state for a very specific reason, which was the propaganda. Uh, now, Nehruvian state after the 1950s was very much invested in sort of propagating this idea of nation building, progressive India, education will, you know, make the India come out of the dark age that is it has had of the colonial past. And all these kind of educational didactic messages that uh, the state wanted to propagate. Obviously, cinema itself in the 50s, as we know, uh, also had this trajectory where cinema was sort of becoming the state apparatus in terms of propagating its ideologies and helping it into sort of 
bringing the masses together through a common you know through common themes and ideas so even animation was sort of having this kind of a trajectory and ironically because it was introduced by the state and as the child of the state as it is called it kind of also became childish and that is what has sort of kind of carried forward or stuck to animation and at least the way uh, most of the audience sort of imagine and think of animation is it is made for a juvenile audience or it is uh uh not serious it is funny it is cartoonish it is disney and all those things so uh having said that uh in that sense post independent india did have its own can we have the next slide please did have its own uh, sort of uh, trajectory and again there was a separate unit that was set through cfsi children's film society of india again a state run body that was invested in sort of promoting films for children films about children and again ideas of education ideas of social well being and all these other kind of uh, you know ideas for public uh, public interest like population control uh, uh, ideas for civic hygiene and then in the theaters as a as a snippet before the feature length film these animation cartoons were sort of introduced and that was the only place in that sense where animation was sort of seen in in uh, you know to a larger audience they didn't have a particular uh, you know an audience from the beginning for watching animation it was kind of a precursor to the main film so then you would have uh, you know like i'm sure all of us remember and i'll show you the clip of that ek chidiya anek chidiya uh which is a little later in the 70s that comes about and i remember watching it on tv and other places uh and just that you remember the rhyme of it right ek chidiya anek chidiya how many trees are there in this forest 1 2 3 how many birds are there in this forest 4 5 6 and all of those things so these kind of ideas sort of were there from the beginning in terms of embedded didactic messages for an audience to sort of pro propagate different kind of ideas but mostly educational for educational propaganda purposes and again uh, we had uh, claire vix who is considered to be the pioneer of an animation in india uh, since he was not an indian but he had deep roots in india and he sort of had experience of creating the bambi the snow white in in the disney and then he was invited for a project to come to india and set up this division and under his tutelage and under his uh, uh, sort of uh, mentoring also we have other fathers of animation that come up like the names that we know of uh uh ram mohan bhim sen and then their their students who are now the contemporary film animator film so it's kind of again it's a very small group of people who have sort of carried forward uh, these animation traditions and classical animation or contemporary animation and all those names are kind of connected with one another because the students have become uh, you know have come from the teachers who have taught them and then nid which was the national institute of design has sort of trained these people because that was the only place where animation was sort of given a special course in itself where people were taught the technique of animation so in that sense this was kind of the trajectory that kind of stayed and stuck with animation both in terms of exhibition where there was not a uh, you know designated audience or even exhibition in terms of there was no television so unless and until the television comes into the picture the doordarshan comes into the picture advertisements come into the picture that we don't see a lot of you know animation being made and because there was not a lot of things be, which were produced because it was state run there was a small unit of people working and funds were limited all those things uh then had to sort of also show as fillers disney started coming so pluto mickey mouse and all these other cartoons from the disney were also then showcased before the film in india and then those again because we were watching ek chidiya anek chidiya but we were also watching the pluto and the snow white so again the association with animation was like oh it's a cartoon you know oh it's funny like it's for children and all those things so and uh, also one of like some of the things that i'm saying here are based on uh, like 
my interviews with a couple of these people uh, who are contemporary animators at IBC, IIT Bombay, and other kind of material that I've got, uh, got is through research on uh, online and you know looking at the interviews of other animators, uh, old and young. Uh, but talking to animators also sort of gave me so all the insights that I'm saying. I'm not saying that as my own or. Uh, but just uh, giving a history which has been sort of collected through research and through interviews of with people of uh, you know of, from the field. Um, uh, also, then Claire Vicks, this is the storyboard for Banny and Deer, uh, which was in 1957. And uh, very interesting about uh, Banny and Deer was that it kind of used um, Jakarta tales again, uh, which was a form of storytelling in Buddhist teaching. And it was used to sort of, again, bring out the ideas of compassion, nonviolence, and the story kind of, I remember this uh, particular one because it was about, uh, you know, how a deer, a golden deer of the forest is sort of able to convince and change the heart of this king who sort of loves, loves to hunt. And because of his sacrifice and because of his principles of saving his kin and kith, over himself, uh, that dear that the that the king has a change of heart and he has, uh, you know, uh, he completely gives into uh, uh, saying that I will not hunt anymore and I spare the entire forest, not just your life. But again, the criticism for this and uh, there is, a, yeah. So Bendazi says that this film, though, had a very interesting kind of a trajectory. And it was one of the first color animation that we've had in 1957. And uh, it said it's it says that it was kind of had a lot of potential because the stories were again coming from Indian tradition. Buddhist Buddhist influence is very huge in Indian oral traditions as well as visual traditions. And uh, where the kind of images used for animation could have been taken from, say, for example, Ajanta, uh, Ajanta caves, which have a lot of motives and images which lend themselves and borrow themselves from Buddhist teaching, the kind of images that were produced were very much Disneyfied or very much American in the sense it didn't, though it had a story which was Indian, the way it was kind of projected in terms of the texture and uh, the kind of images that came out were not giving that essence of you know indianness in that and that is something which is the contemporary uh, animator also trying to sort of uh, carve out in their work this idea of you know authentic indian finding your own rhythm movement time etc and this is something we'll talk about in a bit so this was post 90s and then again because of liberalization television coming to be coming into being again just like how indian cinema has had an interesting history where you know indian cinema becomes bollywood and industry status comes into the picture there are a lot of foreign players in the, in the market now so the funds are coming in but there's also a lot of exposure there is this now special specialized training for animation as well so we see a lot of these uh, Mac studios getting set up and Toon Cinema, Toon's animation, uh, which is a television uh, production house comes into picture and a lot of even advertisements then move towards animation. So if we remember, um, I don't know if I have the picture. Can we move to the next slide? Uh, the next one. OK, go back, go back. Yeah, we can be here. Yeah, OK. So uh, this was pre uh, predominantly the territory. And uh, what the animators are now saying is that was, again, a wave of uh, in Indian animation, where there was, again, suddenly a lot of exposure. There was a different market that one could cater to. But then what happened as a result of that was that it became that global. Like the need to become global was far more than uh, you know, stay and talk about local stories and local ideas. And when I say local, and, and it's not so much about essentializing culture as uh, the animators uh, are talking, but in terms of, you know, having your own style and principle in terms of representing uh, any kind of aesthetic in terms of movement or in terms of how the character can look, what is the texture, what is the feeling, what is the emotion that is being evoked, maybe the dialect itself, all these kind of things uh, is what, uh, you know, the flavor of that Indianness was kind of then getting evaporated very soon. And 
a lot of good talent so that's the challenge is part of it where um, it kind of became uh, either the good talent was then going and working for the disneys of the world because that's where the money was uh, the, uh, or it was about uh, sort of then do trying to do some independent work so then again nid kind of uh, when i was interviewing nina and uh, nina sabnani and uh, shilpa ranade these are the two people i personally interviewed and uh, they were uh, also saying that you know nid also became one of the niche institutes where uh, some kind of uh, independent work and something which will be a little different than the 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 uh, what they call the sweatshop industry uh, would try to do but then these people and because of the lack of fun because of the lack of time and other kind of pressure again it's it's not always easy to sort of uh, you know do work which you think should be done and stuff like that so these are some of the again the ideas that came about i wanted to show up i think i missed out that uh, but can we just go back to sorry can we go to the next one yeah i probably just want to show you guys so this is be good uh, be good boy is betty boop which is 1936 picture uh, can we play this so you will get an idea of again this was a uh, very interestingly this the character of the lady was initially african american and uh, it's an american uh, uh, animation in that sense but uh, very uh, very soon it was then also changed and the lady became white uh, that is also something uh, to do with disney and the kind of history it has had in kind of promoting a lot of stereotypes that's something i want to leave out for today's talk but then now we can look at india's uh, animation which is in 75 uh, which is ek churiya ek churiya can we play this one please बहुत सारे 
बहुत सारे क्या बहुत सारे अच्छा बताती हूँ सूरज एक चंदा एक तारे अनेक तारों को अनेक भी कहते हैं नहीं नहीं देखो फिर से सूरज एक चंदा एक 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 कर के तारे भये दीदी देखो देखो एक गिलहरी पीछे पीछे अनेक गिलहरिया थैंक यू सो कैन वी गो टू द नेक्स्ट लाइक यस सो दैट वॉज हाउ द डायरेक्टरिज्म वॉज इम्बेडेड इन दीज एनिमेटेड कार्टून विच वर देन एग्जिबिटेड एज अ प्रिकॉसर टू द मेन फिल्म बट सोन दिस कैन ऑफ एग्जिबिशन ऑल्सो स्टॉप्ड फॉर वेरियस रीजन फंडिंग पीपल डेन वॉन्ट टू शो केस दिस इन थिएटर्स एंड देन अगेन द ऑडियंस फॉर फॉर एनिमेशन वॉज इन रियली एवर क्रिएटेड इन दैट सेंस सो पीपल वुड नॉट आई द स्टे बैक फॉर द फिल्म uh to end to watch what comes after or uh you know if they do come early that's the only way they can watch these animation uh so in that sense it's never really got an audience uh, per se and that kind of was the case till the television which is what i said so the common consensus and all the kind of voices that are in animation any kind of article anything that comes out is kind of pointing towards indian animation and um like nina sabnani calls it in one of her academic papers it's like the sleeping giant like it, animation in india has the potential to do a lot due to the reasons which is the main crux of this uh, talk uh that it has the rich visual culture and traditions and oral narratives and we are a country which is full of myths and fables and tales but somewhere we have forgotten to tell the stories in in a way that can make it and get the nuances of this kind of aesthetic out so that has been the larger debate and the voices have been talking about you know there are like lack of funds if there is you know good talent which gets outsourced for an uh, animation to uh, for disney uh, also there is very little time they're always working on very stringent timelines the one particular film that i've analyzed closely a uh, little later i will show you guys of ranadi was actually made by cfsi gopi gain baga bain and i'll talk about it just in a bit and the larger thing is this either there is no talent or there is no time or there is no fund and then the whole idea is where is the story or whose story is it anyway everything that in the 90s and the 2000s that we have come to see is the hanuman or uh, this chota bhim character being created in in uh, in uh, on the television for the for the audience of children and these tags about that it is for children it is something which cannot have any kind of nuances and layers and it is didactic all those things kind of have stuck with uh with this uh, with animation as an art and now the contemporary can we move to the next slide yeah now the contemporary animation is what is of interest for me and hopefully for you also where uh, and it's not like this was not didn't exist earlier except it kind of faded or didn't get the kind of um, uh, you know uh, an audience and a platform to exhibit the way it is happening now and i think this kind of a trajectory is also very similar with when i was doing work on children's film uh and looking at the category of films for children and films about children it is a kind of had the same kind of a trajectory so post 2000s and especially late 2005 2010 with independent production houses coming into the picture with independent animators independent filmmakers and various platforms and uh film festivals uh coming or film clubs coming into picture and having their own niche audience for 
different kind of voices and different kind of work even animation in that sense just like how children cinema has kind of made a comeback or has at least had a new wave and a new kind of work is what we are able to see and uh, these two works are uh, very interesting which are done by Nina Sabnani one is uh, she worked with so now we come to what is that this contemporary kind of animation is trying to do different or at least whatever different uh, in whatever way we want to say and that's debatable but the fact that uh, they are trying to then uh, work with the storytellers or these traditions through ethnographic work which where research becomes a part of their animation it's not just about sort of getting giving story uh, uh, you know a uh, sort of a text or an illustrated book into an animated form into the visual into the into the film form but also the fact that looking behind these stories looking at who are the bearers or you know carriers of the storytelling tradition so nina sabnani has worked uh, very much and she still is working with uh, you know uh, for example the weavers of the kutch and that's when she made the stitches speak uh, where she brings in the weaves and the work and the embroidery their their engagement with the cloth all these kind of ideas into the film while she she makes it at least uh, in terms of uh, i mean she believes that there is this voice that uh, she is able to sort of uh, you know corroborate with her animation and the, in, this is the way in which one can sort of revive or uh, revisit these traditions which are diminishing slowly and steadily and this is the other work uh, which is the coward uh, work uh, which she has done again coward is nothing but again it's like a storytelling box where image of uh, the dt is uh, in the box uh, but just the box will not make much of a sense unless and until you have the narrator the storyteller the coward the coward vachna as they say comes and says the story so the same image might have 400 or more interpretations depending on the audience depending on who's listening and Uh, all of those things so this was again the work uh, again she made the film bath wahi hai and this film is very interesting uh, i'm sorry i don't have the clip for this one uh, but uh, where actually the storytellers are also in the picture so she has actually filmed not just she has not just made an animation on the cover uh, but also got these covers to actually uh, the cover uh, vachnas to actually come and talk about this and it's like a dialogue between the two storytellers and they're kind of debating about uh you know or oh, this particular incident in 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 the in the particular life of this god means this and somebody saying no no this means something else and then they're having this kind of a jugal bandi and dialogue between the two and that's how the film goes it's a 13 minute uh, long film and uh, so this is what the kind of work that is now coming and at least that's what uh, the, they are claiming the, the contemporary animators are claiming to sort of revive and revisit these uh, sort of uh, solely telling and also looking at animation which has the scope to sort of uh, sort of incorporate these materialities of these traditions to some extent because as uh, animation is an applied art form they are seeing that it has the potential to uh, sort of uh, look uh, at uh, a lot of embedded immateriality a lot of intangible textures of things can also be sort of then taken into animation form and made make made it make it into an oral visual kind of a storytelling uh, can we have the next slide please thank you so yeah this particular film is uh, what i have worked very closely on uh, a little bit also that's why i interviewed uh, ranade uh, uh, is uh, gopi gawaiya baga bajaiya so it's a very recent contemporary film and it is interesting in many ways because this is also one of the rare films that actually had a theatrical release so it was not just uh, sent to toronto film festivals and had audience watch it everywhere else at film festivals but also it had like a proper a uh, theatrical release in in all the cinemas in india all the big metros and uh, it kind of again is been produced by cfsi children's film society of india and this film also has a trajectory uh, to sort of being told and retold like if we know about gopi ga gavaiya baga bajaiya in a different name it's gopi ga in baga bain which is satyajit's re film 
in the 60s but satyajit ray's film was also a retelling of uh upendra kishore ray chaudhary's uh, 1915 uh, bengali story that was written for children it's a children's classic then later very recently also a uh, gulzar sort of retold this story as a children narrative in hindi and not bengali in hindi and it is for this book that uh, shilpa ranade who is a, a professor and a practitioner of animation at iit uh, who did the illustrations for this book so while doing this folk tale uh, sort of uh, you know which has had a long history of telling and retelling uh, in various mediums from book to film to now animation and books of also different kind from you know in different languages so in that sense uh, her experience of making an illustration for this book kind of uh, made a uh, 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 kind of made it feel that it should also be animated at least that's what she said in her interview and uh, the images of the characters as she say, say lended themselves to be remodeled into the animated version and uh, the animation art the material art in the design of animation used in this film is actually again inspired from the age old tradition that we talked about very early on which is the tugalu gumbayata or tugalu bombata in different uh, dialects it's called different things which is basically a visual storytelling traditions of uh, leather dolls uh, which has a lot of you know uh, traditional sh uh, shadow puppetry theater tradition it comes from but also this is an art form which is then now slowly sort of either dying or not getting the due exposure that it deserves uh, again the ethnographic work on this particular art form believes uh, and points that there is very limited aesthetic reach of this art form uh, it has not found much adaptation even in the newer media though it is one of the oldest form of tradition of storytelling and it's primarily just restricted to either decorative items or uh, crafts and you know melas where you see or uh, maybe a lamp of tugalu gumbayata the image that we saw in the beginning you know all these uh, shadow puppetry with minute uh, detailing of how they are drawn and also the research points towards that there is a need to sort of then readapt and uh, these kind of techniques and forms into new formats and then animation as we see in this film so kind of does that it tries tries to get those uh, shadow puppetry and puppet like characters uh, it's a very interesting film i recommend that you all watch it uh, that it comes alive and again the story is very simple but also it's very universal it can be taken into uh so uh into account about you know uh, a rivalry between siblings or rivalry between nations or rivalry between uh people who think differently or you know it can be taken as a nationalistic level the kind of tension india always has with its neighbor or personal level about how we as people have tensions with our neighbors and also in that at, at international level also about some of the characters which are kind of found anywhere and everywhere this kind of universality is something where ranade is saying that that's why it is not just for children so even when adults did watch this film they felt they were resonate uh, there, there was some resonance with the kind of characters they have met in their neighborhood or their locality or their family or somewhere uh, can we have uh, the 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 uh, the trailer it's actually not a trailer i've picked up a song to show बहुत बढ़िया उत्तम आप गाते हैं और हम बजाते हैं क्या बजाते हैं बांसुरी नहीं सोचिए क्या बजाते होंगे सितार नहीं अच्छा ढोल बहुत तेज बुद्धि है आपकी अब मिलेगी ताल से ताल दुनिया देखेगी जुगलबंदी का कमाल बदल जाएगी अपनी चाल रुमाल धमाल काल ढाल घोड़े की नाल
llama Vuelo tap sees that the world of the old age old characters of Gopi and Baga being transformed visually through the twinkling twinkling worlds of twinkling twinkling world of Mojris, Indian ethnic Juttis, Jhumka big ethnic earrings, shaped balconies, embroidered deer goats and ghost king singing along while dressed up in printed textures of tree bark leaves and fire. The composition of the animated images suggest how the visual medium of the film imitates the embedded latent materiality of the other form, other art form, in this case, shadow puppetry. Also, in this animation style, one can see that it's a very staccato kind of a style. It's the, the, the images are not very smooth and it's grainy. And that is the intention of the animator, as she says, which is also something resembling of the way in which puppets are. Uh, and uh, Ranade in her work and in most of her work has tried to sort of then really emphasize on the fact that one needs to then look beyond the burden that we are carrying, uh, which she says as the baggage of the Disney or the mythology or even technology, where the emphasis is a lot more on the technique than the story and the way the story can be told in the way different kind of elements, the rhythm of body, time, sense of time, space can be thought about more or less. It is kind of either dependent on the Disney, the mythology or even technology today, because it's not it's all about the 3D and the and the and the and the 4D and that kind of uh, a very uh, hyperbolic and very extravagant and polished version of animation. And she says that I would want in my work to sort of stay away from this kind of uh, motives and then bring my own kind of sensibility, things I see around and uh, look at, uh, you know, ideas which are more immediate. So in that sense, she's saying there is a need to contextualize animation design in India, which can give us more ideas for how we can be more creative with animation and storytelling itself. Uh, also, this comes from the fact that animation, like I said in the beginning and this last few concluding points is about how these kind of uh, practices in uh, has, uh, you know, the legacy that they can imbibe from the drama, the puppetry, the performing art, the theater, the color, color palette connected to a lot of celebrations, ritual and symbolism, which are present in the Indian context. Uh, so in that sense, one way to reclaim and revisit the storytelling tradition would be uh, also then adding value to this animation in Indian uh, scenario where things can look different and feel different and can have its own story. 
uh, all right so just more or less this is the kind of observations and the reflections of the animators and now my effort has been to sort of bring all these voices together and then i'm also thinking about how now the animators now who are self reflecting on their own work and uh, positioning their work in this particular tradition of reviving certain so oral and visual storytelling traditions and also then innovating design in animation trying to do things differently the question then now i'm having are multiple in terms of uh, uh, how you know uh, what are the challenges that can come within this new format or not so much of a challenges but the possibilities or then reflect on the work that is going on in today's uh, time is one is um i'll just give me a minute can we have the last slide please the next slide do we have a next slide no okay all right okay i've run out of ideas here but i will uh, talk about a few things one is uh, like we said that this this the stigma or this understanding of why is it juvenile or is it for children that's one thing that i've tried to extend and think through and the idea that comes to mind again and again looking at betty boop looking at ek chidiya ne ek chidiya looking at anything to do with cartoon or these creatures which are not you know live action which are not a sharukh or a salman or uh, you know a people like us you and me anything which is an animated in that sense um has this association that it's consumption for a juvenile audience or it's non serious and that comes back to this idea of imagination which is animation itself is a medium which is not real it works a lot on imagination it is a creative form of art itself and the fact that this imagination is then understood in a way which is juvenile so anything which is for children is considered to be non serious or the fact that we say that children are more imaginative and adults are not so i'm just trying to see and probably draw and maybe stretch a little too much about how then this imagination like art adults then starved of this imagination is india as a as a cultural uh, 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 uh you know as an entity which has these rich richness in culture richness in oral tradition but this idea of that now there is no creativity again and again the voices that come out is that there is no talent or there is no time or there is no fund or there is uh, there is uh, there is we are not making our own stories we have forgotten to tell our own stories so then what is this forgetting what is the genesis or where can this backdrop of forgetting be is that then something to do with how imagination and creativity itself is not given that kind of space and in a uh, in uh, environment especially in our educational setup where creative arts or anything to do with arts is or humanities in that sense kind of faces the challenges vis a vis compared to the engineer and the science and the rote learning and you know uh, anything which is very uh, sort of established and is very traditional so in that sense then is imagination uh, restricted because of the kind of culture that we have come to by imbibe which is about rote learning which is about uh, you know uh, we can't think through our own ideas and we need to sort of set a benchmark or follow the benchmark set by the west in this thing so this is one of the thought that i am trying to explore and see how i can ground this more theoretically and philosophically the second is about this practice of revisiting or reviving it in itself right so now most of the traditions that we saw today are both visual and oral and uh, as much as uh, the visual of like in ranades and sabnani's work is successfully able to embed and appropriate the visual uh, materiality of these traditions and art forms the orality the orality of the narrator the orality of that story itself is then not be able to adapt it in that format like those what what about the voice what about the orality something also i have i have been thinking about so at one level the design material texture and colors of the handcrafted paraphernalia of the oral storytelling 
comes into the picture but what happens to the voice is an aspect that yes the the animators themselves are also aware of uh, like sabnani says that we need to be uh, very very cautious about appropriating these stories in a different format unless and until we are not keeping the storyteller and the communities who are the 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 guardians of these stories into the picture right uh, so they are also self reflecting and i'm just thinking it further or through it where uh, um yeah so in that sense characters do come alive on screen they float on screen uh, and uh, they have these materiality but there is something intangible with the performance of these storytelling right this is the voice this is where the storyteller coming comes into the picture so in that sense uh, bombata and shambrik karolika and all these were very intimate affairs they were not more than for maybe 100 people of audience enjoying a performance on an evening and then the same story traveling through different villages uh, and the characters that are given life like in that sense even the energy of the puppeteer sort of gets transferred to the puppet in order for it to give that uh entire experience to that audience right so in that sense it is very much with the breath of the storyteller with every note that reverberates out of their throat and their lungs each narration could then also be very different and organically adapted to the kind of audience you're catering to so in that sense it's very intuitive it's very uh, spontaneous and it is also alive in that sense in that sense somewhere probably this kind of a performance is more like a live broadcast as we can understand today uh, where the format is itself the the crux of how the performance or or the entire uh, idea of that story is coming out to be so in in that sense if it uh, the traditional storytelling the ability to be this alive be this uh, spontaneous uh, this thing then are we then sacrificing or is it that at stake then when we look at the permanence of the modern visual technique which is the film in which we are trying to freeze the frame in which we are trying to tell the story but it is in that sense not uh, you know just alive in that sense it's something which is again uh, curated very very differently it's something where you do not have like uh, how ranadi was talking about in her interview that she she does the drawing she sends it to the film unless and until the print of the film or the film comes out you never know how the drawing has actually taken shape so in that sense it's kind of in the blind right it's not something where you can just immediately have that reaction and that response and that uh you know uh, some 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 adaptability can happen from the performer side to uh, to the audience uh so that's another thing that i'm trying to uh, uh, get my head around um so in that sense the puppet is the same but the stories can be told differently right so even in the shambrik uh, uh, tradition the, the lantern earlier on there were thousand slides and there were four storytellers who were trying to sort of take turns to sort of tell their stories in 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 uh, 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 bombata itself we have the whole extravaganza we have the music we have the lady talking we have the man singing we have the narrative going and there is also these real time uh you know maybe disruptions within the performance there are sometimes they stop sometimes they think they should improvise there is a lot of like dialogue sometimes which is not spoken loud but told through gestures all those things also happen during that performance so in that sense this kind of orality can then if it is transferred in the in the visual format which is is it then are we then sort of sacrificing that or where is that orality lost is something also that i want to uh, sort of look at uh, and maybe the last point uh, would be animation to be looked at as a subversion itself like since we are talking about imagination we talked about phantasmagoria uh, mogoria which is not just the film that was made but also as a concept it works with this imagination which works with this idea of creating the illusion in that sense animation is not real from the word go so it already falls in the realm of imagination and anything that we see in this imaginative uh, uh, in this imaginative medium in that sense for example if we look at japanese anime 
right the kind of uh, stories and the kind of characters and the kind of metaphors used in japanese anime which is a one of the huge industries and in, in animation in the world has made its own niche it has made its own ideas which are popular worldwide which has kind of universal ideas which works with fantasy which works with uh, you know uh, after life and uh, death and all these other kind of very very philosophical concepts and it is very in that sense it has its own language and the kind of messages embedded in those animation are not in that sense kiddish or childish so this juvenility that we are sort of associating in indian animation can't we go like is there a way to go against that grain of standardizing and normalizing uh, which the mainstream media which is what has been the biggest debate in any kind of independent or niche kind of work uh, especially in the indian context where there is an audience for this mainstream there is an audience for a salman khan and a blockbuster and you have a promoter and you will have different releases for the same thing again and again but then there are these other kind of things which might have the potential to sort of save things and talk about ideas which aren't said otherwise but they don't are not given that platform to exhibit so in that sense again animation as a subversive uh, form of art itself can be uh, sort of looked at in terms of not just juvenile but this idea of imagination which is at the heart of it then can that be um, pushed to actually ask and talk about uh, you know any kind of subversive and embedded kind of not so ex uh, in, uh, explicit ideas and messages uh, these are some of my observations honestly i don't know if it makes much sense but uh, i will be happy to now take questions and also just find out what's happening okay yeah thanks a lot sonia that was a uh, exciting uh, presentation. There's a bunch of questions in the chat box, which I will get to in a second. Uh, I just want to respond uh, very quickly. Uh, I have a jumble of thoughts in my head in response to what you've been saying. Um, one is that we, you know, uh, we kind of getting to, or we are in a stage which is very uh, multimedia. It's either it's, it's a intermedial kind of uh world that we live in and so it is now increasingly difficult to segregate one medium or one form from another uh and therefore i think the work that you've undertaken is kind of very exciting because you're trying to trace back um some kind of authentic uh if one may use that term right although that is also a very questionable term uh history uh some pure kind of trajectory so one one is that uh, that in the intermediate context is there another way of looking at what animation itself means uh in the sense that if one looks at patwa chitra or even uh, you know the illustrated manuscripts which of course are not animation but they work with a certain logic of relationship between text and image in some sense and the patwa chitra which is at the center of the whole controversy of our art schooling uh, you know art, art education being changed during colonial rule and then ravi varma trying to school himself in a particular kind of um, artistic practice introducing allegedly introducing realism into the indian context uh, and so the position from where you're speaking of you know a realism versus an animation which is not realism i think maybe it would be interesting to re-examine that contradiction and conflict because perhaps it is a, a superficially imposed kind of distinction that is one uh, response and the other is that how would you place this uh, search for an indian animation uh in relationship to let's say the video game industry where which which has seen a lot of indian you know uh, the gaming industry is huge because i think that we are we need to i mean you're talking about analog animation but there's also huge amount of digital animation uh which is taking place so i wonder if that is something that you will uh you intend to take in yes account in your research yeah yeah i think i have also tried to uh, i don't know if it didn't come out very clearly but i have tried to put in this idea of essentializing or what is this authentic indianness that is kind of becoming uh, 
like everybody is saying and talking about you know we are not telling our own stories and what is this unique form of animation that we are striving for and in that sense like examples from like japanese animation and even for example i mean kung fu panda is nothing to do with america it's okay it's american animation but from the music to the themes the the character everything is from a different culture a different tradition so in that sense if you have a story then it can have this very universal kind of a reach and kind of an audience and even you know message so at one level yes i also have thought about this very much like what the voices which are contemporary voices are saying about trying to tell you know indian stories and uh, why there is such a strong need to make that uh you know a uh, position about india india has arrived or in all formats we are seeing that so that is something that i have been thinking but yes definitely i will uh, look into some of the points that you have uh, also mentioned because it is a work in progress and thank you okay there are thanks sonia uh, there are some questions so anna maria john are you here would you like to unmute and uh, ask your query Good evening, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ma'am, I think uh, Sonia, ma'am, kind of uh, uh, pointed this out at the last. But when you said that uh, Indian animation is seen as a more of a juvenile form because it's more related to imagination, ma'am, can you hear me? Sonia? Yeah, you're audible. Okay. Uh, Indian animation is seen as more of a juvenile art form because it's more related to imagination. But then again, uh, Japanese animation is not seen like that, uh, which you pointed out uh, at the end. Isn't this more related because Indian animation more or less seems to uh, deal with providing a model to the uh, viewer uh, and doesn't really uh, deal with adult themes like in ja in Japanese animation or in like. Uh, even in Disney and Pixar films, like there are parts where some you wouldn't under really get it unless you are an adult. But in Indian animation, I don't think you have that sort of uh, thing. Uh, thank you, Anna. I don't know if I caught the entire question that you have, but in terms of how uh, Indian animation is considered juvenile or is it considered imaginative? I, I think your voice is breaking, or it's my internet. Uh, Rashmi, if you want yeah, to yeah, I think I think uh, her, her, she's comparing it to Japanese uh, anime, and she's trying to say that uh, it's not the form of the animation as form that is juvenile because Japanese anime isn't considered as being for children. But is it that Indian animation is to maybe perhaps considered as uh, being for children because of its content? yeah okay yeah yeah i think that's uh, pre predominantly been the history in that sense right like it was introduced in a in this kind of a propaganda didactic message like you're saying it has that moral of the story right like at the end of ek chidiya ek chidiya we learn about how everybody can live in harmony we are a country of different languages different people and people can uh, you know still live in peace and harmony so unity is what we are you know then there are other things about population control and civic hygiene and most of them have in that sense used children and because they also have children character uh, this is what even children's uh, film even like live action children's film in india is sort of considered anything that have children in them kind of gives that image that oh it is it is preachy or it has these uh, you know uh, very didactic very uh, you know educational purpose purpose films and because that's how it was like if you look at even uh, main uh, feature length films like uh, i'm giving example not of animation but just to give you that where is this kind of thinking coming from it has also had a very long history but it's mostly post independent uh, you know indian history where children were used as the you know the the future citizens in the making so you have nanne munne rahi teri mutthi mein kya hai mutthi mein hai takdeer hamari that's a very popular song in the 50s from boot polish which is basically using children to talk about what is the future of india what it holds for them and how 
we will then become this new independent free India and you know education is at the center of it and you see that those children walking out towards the dawn and there's a school image at the at the forefront of that ending of that film and it's when you know they come out of this poverty they come out of all the problems and education is the solution for everything so in that sense this kind of very Nehruvian idea of uh, you know educating uh, the masses word was done with children using children and because it was introduced like I said the unit itself came into being through this cartoon unit which was part of the children's film society unit uh, film division and uh, CFSI so in that sense it had that from the beginning so and the other point was when I say imagination that is what I want to also challenge like if imagination is considered to be juvenile because uh you know children are juvenile and also anything which is it like you know like what are you saying this is so childish anything imaginative is childish is the kind of the association one has with this concept of imagination at least when a style is told to keep quiet keep quiet this is all imaginative or oh you had a dream that's all imaginative uh, you're making up stories or you know this idea so in that sense this this kind of in the language in the way children are talked to or children are thought about itself is something to do with I don't know but I feel there is something about this Indian cultural kind of where child should be protected child has a certain trajectory to take it is in the it's the future citizen in the making it has that kind of education in our country is sort of you know made on that line where we need to become something uh you know this is a phase you know like amitabh bachchan will be the angry young man only because he has had this traumatic childhood of seeing his parents dead and killed so in that sense this kind of a consequential kind of a phase is what childhood has always seen not like something which is in its own uh, right it's not seen as, a, as 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 an age where you know ideas and everything else is as as important and as integral it is always towards something else so in that sense uh, that can be the uh, reason for this juvenile and imaginative but i want to ask that if if that is how imagination is thought then what is the genesis of that in the sense I mean, I want to critique look at the larger cultural understanding of India's idea of rote learning and education and how everything else than humanities and uh, the arts is considered, right? Art has always low or less value than, for, for example, a commerce or a science. And I don't know if these are very large kind of uh, conclusions. And uh, But at least in my talk and at least the way I want to think or at least push for it is towards that, looking at that that backdrop against which then even animation then becomes a way to talk about that probably yeah okay okay Anna I hope that was some fodder for thought for you there's another question Gopika Rakesh uh, Gopika do you want to unmute and ask your question also about Japanese anime Gopika, are you there? Hello. Yes, ma'am. I just got disconnected. I'm very sorry. Um, so, ma'am, uh, my question was not primarily about Japanese animation as such. It's about when you are talking, you keep on emphasizing an Indian way of animation per se. And when we talk about this Indian way of animation, if you look at animation in the West it and the Japanese anime, it has been influenced by each other a lot. If you take animation in any country, it has always been influenced by the animation that has risen at the same time and even the time before it. So it's kind of like using stepping stones as such. So can we actually say that Indian animation getting influenced by outside sources is such a bad thing? And can there actually be a truly Indian animation or something that has not had influence from outside? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, but that's precisely what I'm not saying. Uh, I don't know if it was confusing, but uh, that's exactly what. So this kind of finding your own voice and where are the stories which are Indian and this kind of, I think that has to be questioned. And 
through these voices which are obviously self reflecting they are not saying that we are not getting inspired from elsewhere but this idea like this is one question that i haven't found my answer as well is what is this that you know again and again indians have forgotten to tell their stories and we need to find a unique animation design or tell your own story so some of the ideas i get it in terms of you know like uh, for example ranade was talking about the sense of time like indians have a very different sense of time where sometimes even in a sentence or even the way we talk and think um you know past future and pre present all all comes together uh, but uh, you know it, it's not linear in that sense right that the way indian mind thinks or whatever but in that sense like i am also asking that question that essentializing this indianness uh, or even now that it is happening uh, is there like what is the need for that and is that even important because like that's why i'm saying the kung fu panda example or this idea of you know having universal themes uh like we all have watched uh, life of pi and other kind of uh, live life of pi is an live action film but still in the sense of looking at uh you know animation which has this universal kind of language because it is not in that sense realistic it's not going to represent the reality even even to an extent how cinema does right in that sense it's already it's outside the realm of this representation which is very straightforward we are anyway creating an uh uh you know imagining the form of it like the texture of it like the movement of it everything so in that sense it's already not uh, a real representation of anything in that sense so then finding this real indian voice is also something that has to be a uh, question and explored more and like it's a step towards asking that first bringing those voices saying what this is what it is but then also pushing and asking those voices back saying what is it this what is it that we need to do to make the story our own and what is this our own so that's something that should be there and yes i'm glad that most of the questions that are coming are also pointing me towards thinking about this uh, which is what has has also been uh, my attempt yeah um Ma'am, I also kind of had wanted to ask you something else. Uh, like, in the, if you look at uh, social media nowadays, there are certain independent animators who who produce animation films that are not what you can call kiddish per se. So, I feel that the situation nowadays is actually changing a bit. Yes, definitely it is. It is definitely. okay thanks uh, sonia and gopika i mean in fact we had uh, i think one of the uh, first indian films going to the venice film festival and the busan film festival and i think as well khan as well that bombay rose by gitanjali rao so uh, okay we move to yeah divya you have a comment uh hi yes thanks for the talk sonia this is not a question but uh it's just uh something maybe of a suggestion that um when you were talking and the kind of themes that you were uh, interested in uh you know specifically this uh, the figure of the child imagination uh indianness a sense of place the institutional context of animation the history and so on and that sort of made me think of and it sort of converged on this uh, uh, an animated short uh, film which was released in 2018 but it got an online release only last uh, month i think or, or in july uh, and it's this animation film called tokri uh, it's a claymation uh, film and uh, it has done like the rounds of the festival circuits and all that and it has also been produced by a pune based um, studio ixorus if uh, i'm not wrong and it sort of it, it when all the things that you were talking about it it really sort of drew me again and again to this film because it is a claymation film it is about a little girl selling baskets on the street of mumbai it sort of uh, won a lot of awards for bringing alive this kind of cityscape it has a child at the center it is talking about a father child relationship and all these things apart from that it is also a part of um the studio which has a kind of history of paying homage to uh, studio ghibli and their uh, relationship to the child in the way they uh, make their narratives and claymation itself and also because you talked about subversion as well and the craft and materiality and claymation itself somehow you know it it's 
labor intensive it's time intensive it's relatively low cost as well uh, compared to you know so it has that potential for a kind of autonomy perhaps which is there and this film itself took 8 years to put together uh, from scripting and all that so um, and it had it seemed to me that all the themes that you mentioned would would find a very nice kind of object if you were to look at this film um uh, and i think it would be quite uh, nice and useful and it it it's on uh, it's a 14 minute short film and perhaps then because then because claymation is this entire kind of tradition of animation which is in some sense uh, you know anti disney in that sense that it is uh, you know it is labor it is done by hand and it it's not really automatic in that sense so maybe that uh, combined with all your other concerns about childhood and uh, cityscapes and having a local voice this might also be something you could consider uh, yeah. maybe looking at definitely yeah. thank you so yeah. much for that i will so, uh, it's called tokri and uh, uh, it's studio xorus in pune or something yeah, yeah there is a lot of work i mean there yeah. is like once you put uh, i mean i'm sure that's what research is about but i have also come across in the recent last week when i was working on some some amazing shots of mm-hmm. films which are nowhere i mean unless you really have yeah. that name when like even someone's mentioned yes. suresh uh, right, right, right. Uh, yeah. you know uh, and then i've listened to his interview uh, about and how his trajectory has been about i can mm-hmm. uh, so i'll just probably try and answer this the limbo about the lack of original stories of writers who can think and write animation what's your take on that so i think uh, i think ish suresh uh, was very interesting voice and in when i was looking at all these kind of people talking because his trajectory has been about you know trying to sort of be strike a balance between doing independent work about the stories that he wants to tell but also then not completely dis, uh, uh, you know as uh, dissociate himself from the the commercial the lucrative the the money the money aspect of it and i think he very unbashedly talks about that in one of his interviews uh at audio gyan where uh, he's saying that uh, you know i mean he took what came through him so even um uh bindu meri pyari bindu uh, which was the first animation f- advertisement uh, i'm sure we all remember if we just google that 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 one then he worked with like very commercially advertisement brands and you know people uh, at the very go of understanding and wanting to do animation and still if you look at his work like freedom uh and others where uh he is also doing some of the kind of nuances of you know getting the texture and the materiality which has some kind of an aesthetic resonance with the indian context so he is kind of doing both in that sense and uh so it's kind of a limbo like uh, yes indian animation uh has that idea of wanting to tell their stories but also then there are different platforms like ishu patel again will be uh uh in the 70s ishu patel is now a contemporary indian canadian uh, uh, animator and uh, his work is very very universal i don't think so he has any themes and he doesn't use children he his animation has a uh, uh, you know a very uh, philosophical depth to the kind of you know the the kind of even emotions that come into so his film paradise is is, is beautiful again a short film and he is one of the leading animators who's now in canada like but he is still trying to not consider himself that i'm indian and or i am westerner or but he's just telling the stories in in the format and the way that he wants to so that's another film that kind of gives you that a uh, very universal theme theme which can have this extension to go across cultures and does not does not necessarily i'm sorry for the lack of light at the back i think i should switch on my light but yeah i understand this kind of this different tension that is there between wanting to tell this indian stories vis-a-vis uh what is the need to tell them anyway or uh and then obviously this inter uh, multiple mediums that are there to tell the stories now like how rashmi is pointing out so yeah, i think there is a lot that can be said and should be said okay i think we we'll- running out of time we have only 7 minutes left and there are few more questions so apeksha uh, do you want to unmute yourself
Is Apeksha Ghimire here? Okay, I'll read out what she's saying until she manages to unmute herself. She uh, said, she all right, I don't think so. She wants to answer. Oh, she doesn't. Okay, okay. okay. So she, basically, she's. Uh, I'll read out her comment. The talk was very interesting. This is sort of a different interpretation of retelling. I'm from Nepal, and a lot of my Indian friends are surprised to know that I understand Hindi. Nepali media in general is actually very heavily dominated by the Indian one. Animation is especially dominated. I grew up watching Japanese, British, and American animations all dubbed in Hindi. Now there is this new generation of children who know Hindi words for some things, but not the Nepali words. Do you want to respond to that, uh, Sonia? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think that is very relatable. I think that's what's happening um, across. I mean, we know more. I don't know English than we know Hindi. At least the meaning of some of the words. So I think that's what happens when uh, you know one particular kind of language becomes the common language and uh, yeah as a as a way to say that even the house help i have is actually from nepal but uh, she has been in bangalore and she speaks all the languages except nepali uh, not because uh, you know i mean not because she doesn't know it she understands it but there are not many people around her that can talk so again her touch with that language is again uh, you know broken or at least it's rusted and uh, it is about that right like what what you see what you consume what you hear what you watch is what you will then also use and i think that's something cannot i don't know if it can be i don't know if this can be i mean there is an easy answer to this but it is what it is and it's happening everywhere yeah i just want to add to that and say that you know there are now independent initiatives which are trying to make animations uh, in uh, very local uh, languages including a lot of tribal languages uh, okay. tara uh, i'm forgetting her surname tara something she's a, a animator and um, sort of media activist who's been working with tribal communities to document their stories use their traditions of uh, art and make them into animation films so uh, to apeksha i want to say that you know it's actually now much more easily possible to produce media in many different languages so hopefully this situation uh, will change until then we can all thank um, chota beam for teaching us hindi okay there is uh, another question moses uh, johnson from the school of architecture would you uh, like to read out would you like to say out your question please Okay, since we are really running out of time, we have three minutes left. I will read. Yeah, hi, hi, hi. Yeah, hi, hi. Yeah, I just wanted to say like more, uh, what I, I was thinking is like most of the contents which uh, which were produced in the early earlier like nineties or, uh, or probably eighties. So most of the contents uh, are actually uh, qualitatively very uh, very immersive kind of. Uh, experience we get, but uh, nowadays uh, there those things are actually miss missed in this uh, present generation. Like uh, uh, maybe taking some examples also, we can get to know like uh, the quality content is a lack. Uh, what is uh, that is what I wanted to say. Yeah, I think that's. Uh... Exactly what uh, Rashmi pointed out. I think now there are possibilities to get that, like how you're saying, context and regional voices, uh, content possible in different formats, uh, including animation or otherwise. And I think there is happening. So in that new media format, even in that sense, TikTok, maybe it's a different context and the whole debate can go on about that. But the fact that it is, again, catering and bringing out a very different kind of an audience and consumership altogether. In a very different format, and at one level, um, you know, it is as valid as uh, 
other kind of formats that we have today so i think the possibility to create this kind of qualitative and also contextual uh content is very much possible in this new media age that we are and i think uh this intermedial context is at the heart of a lot of things that i also should look at in terms of whether we need these kind of binaries uh of oral and visual and other kind even there's vr and uh, uh you know virtual reality and other kind of things coming in theater performance space as well so yeah i think that is will be an extension to how probably in terms of possibilities where we do not have to essentialize or look at these binaries as in such strict manner uh is something that i should put that uh, i should put that down as well that's it thank you okay there is a question from bhuvan saxena who wants you to comment on something that e suresh has said i think uh, i already commented yeah commented on that so we will um, go past that there uh, there's a link to tokri and there is a question from shrajna uh, do you want to ask your question shrajna it's not as much as the question as it's a comment uh, thanks sonia for the talk i thought like uh, more than concerns of indianness or uh, regionality i thought the importance was more about uh, you know also trying to understand what kind of a self is the child and to just uh, treat uh, you know children and the whole idea of what it is to be juvenile with the same kind of dignity and respect as we may do as an adult right and so when creating content for children perhaps i think that's an important point uh, that we should keep in mind and that's something i found uh, as an important takeaway from the talk and of course and all these subtle sort of the quality that we said about intangible right the intangible textures that are possible to capture in animation i think that's a uh, that's the strength of animation as a medium so thanks so much and that's it's just a, a insight that's it so thank you yeah thank you srachna yeah i think uh, that is one of my uh, uh, you know uh, biggest kind of the burning question as well right what is this juvenile about the ju juvenile self and what is this differentiation that we want to do in terms of then creating content or essentializing or just yeah like this has been my concern since my phd work as well right what is that the figure of the child has uh, to do with in terms of its right and expression and understanding which is then considered in bracketed as something uh, which is not for adults or uh, if it is then it is has to have this kind of a message didactic uh, tone to it so yeah definitely i think that is the crux uh, so i'm glad that that came out because that has been my uh you know larger idea also to understand how we understand children as well um and how can it be done differently because we have examples in different context uh where things are happening very differently for children whether it's in the educational literacy space or in the visual medium space so i think uh that's clearly also where i also want to head um and then look at you know different forms of literacy also that's why i'm looking at multimedia storytelling in some of my other work and uh, how the understanding of literacy is changing now children are makers of their own stories it's not just that they are consumers of the story like the medium is now accessible to children they can tell their own stories and they are telling their own stories so that itself has to be sort of taken into account when we look at uh, you know children as a category or uh, this distinction between the two the adult and the child so yeah thank you i'm glad it came out a little bit like that okay thanks a ton sonia this was a very uh, interesting session i think uh, there is another separate session that could be had on animation and extreme violence uh because on the one hand you have yeah which is you know i think there's a lot of conversation okay. to be had there right yeah, yeah. so we we'll schedule another mesa terra for you <laughs> to address that but for today <laughs> thank you for this one <laughs> okay thank, thank you. you and thank you to everybody for hanging in and asking your questions uh, i think there's an announcement to be made about the next uh, session
which is um, uh, it's going to show up on the screen now if it's visible yeah it's visible so our next speaker is dr anisur rahman and he's going to be talking about the poetics and politics of translation this is on the 30th of september at the same time so hope to see some of you there thank you goodbye